All right, welcome everyone to the Hallie Ford School of Graduate Studies lecture series at the Pacific Northwest College of Art at Willamette University. This is our final uh, lecture of the season for 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, my name is Sky Murray. I'm the chair of Collaborative Design and Design Systems graduate program uh, here, and I am super excited uh, for to, to invite uh, Michael Brenner today to speak to us. Uh, we'll leave introductions uh, in, for a couple minutes from now, but he, uh, I had the pleasure and, and joy of uh, working with Data for Change in uh, their Beirut workshop in in 2018, and I think also in 2018 the the one in Amman, Jordan. In Amman, yeah. And so, just a little bit about collaborative design. Um, it's kind of in its final year. Uh, we have uh, incredible students and faculty who are working really um, thinking about uh, design in a much more holistic way, really focused on systems thinking, participatory design. Um, you know, collaborative methods and, you know, of course, design aesthetics and design thinking. Um, and so we really choose uh, to invite speakers who really, whose values really align with all of our interests and then kind of the good we want to, we hope to see in the world. And um, so to, to uh, the kind of the final aspect of our, our year coming up in our program is um, that I hope you'll join us for. I just wanted to alert you to uh, Thursday, May 2nd, our final MFA MA thesis exhibition is coming up. So if you are around and in Portland, please join us for that or look for future visuals online. Um, for today's speaker, I to introduce Michael, I'm going to turn it over to one of our incredible MFA students, Austin Rock. Uh, to introduce uh, Michael, Austin Rock is an architect, designer, artist, and educator based in Portland. Uh, their work is rooted in participatory placemaking from the classroom uh, to our neighborhoods, e existing at the intersection of design build place-based activism and hands-on skill building. Their practice, uh, the center of their practice is centered on people and exploring how we communicate, support each other and build our worlds together. Um, so I'll hand it over to Austin to introduce Michael. Thanks, Guy. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Michael Brenner. Michael Brenner is head of design at Data for Change, a nonprofit organization that defends human rights with data. Data for Change works with a wide array of civil uh, society organizations, activists, and human rights defenders, and creative talent collaborating at the intersection of data, design, technology, and journalism on projects that forge real change and have lasting impact. Michael has over 15 years of experience working as a designer specializing in data visualization and information design. Before joining Data for Change, Michael was the design director of the design and data studio Beyond Word Studio, formerly Information is Beautiful Studio, in London. Prior to this, he ran his own studio and design collective in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands, Context Context. Michael also taught at the Willem de Kooning Academy in graphic de design and lectured in the fashion department about design, communication, and lifestyle trends. He has collaborated and led on projects for organizations such as the UN, World Bank, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Google, Guggenheim Museum, MoMA, New York Times, Cooper, Cooper Hewitt, Al Gore, and the Queen of Thailand. Michael's approach and practice to design focuses on creating tools and experiences to amplify voices, messages, and ideas. It is holistic and research-driven with the intent to clarify and engage an audience to create perspective. Design is about people working together to connect the dots. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Michael. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, I can actually skip the first 15 slides, <laughs> but I'm gonna but we'll, we'll connect those all together. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a super pleasure to be here um, with you today to talk about um, Data for Change. But before we get into that, I wanted to uh, dive a little bit deeper into my background as a designer. Um, and oops, let's see, let's get these going. Okay, so here we go. So we have this expression at Data for Change, um, are you riding the data unicorn? And what that means is pretty much what you see here in this slide. You're really, really excited to explore and you're just like in this mode where you're trying to figure out what the data is telling you, what are the meaning, the hidden stories behind it. And you're kind of riding this wave and really riding the data unicorn. And I hope that at the end of this presentation, you'll all be inspired to also ride the data unicorn. So with that, again, my name is Michael Brenner um, and I'm a graphic designer who happens to work with data 
And with 99.9999% certainty, this kid was not going to be a doctor. So that's, that's, that's how I wound up uh, becoming a graphic designer. I was uh, born and raised in a small town in the Northwest of Connecticut called Lakeville. Um, it's got, well, at the time I had about 500 residents. It's just two hours North of New York City. And a little fun fact, there's one resident of note in our town, uh, Meryl Streep. She lived there for, and still has a house there and lived there for a period of time. And I had the pleasure of going to the public school with her daughter, Mamie. And I also happened to light Meryl Streep's lawn on fire um, when I was about eight years old with two other friends by accident at a birthday party. So I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that later on. But moving on from Lakeville. After Lakeville, uh, I attended uh, Savannah College of Art and Design down in Georgia. Um, back here in the corner behind the Forrest Gump bench, there's a building and I worked in the cafe down there. So another encounter with a pretty famous person back in the day. Uh, after Savannah, uh, returned back to New York City uh, to work as a graphic designer. And that's really where I started to understand where design was uh, in terms of how we could use design beyond just um, selling products or goods and, and, and using graphic design as a tool to enhance the environments around us, but also for cultural educations, uh, sorry, cultural institutions and uh, educational institutions. Now, this was a time, this was 2005. So design was still going through this very weird morphic phase where it was like everyone was trying to figure out, okay, well, what does design for good mean? How can we enhance and uh, create other projects just beyond what you would normally uh, see in classic design history? So a lot of the projects that I worked on as a graphic designer were for, like I said, cultural and educational institutions. And this is where actually I really start to find uh, data visualization uh, in design. And when I was working at a studio in Brooklyn called Management Design, we were always trying to figure out a way of how we could figure out to incorporate data as a content type into exhibitions, into books. Um, we had worked, uh, when I was at Management, we had worked on the follow-up book to um, Al Gore's first book, uh, Inconvenient Truth, Our Choice. Uh, a plan to solve the climate crisis. Unfortunately, we're still working on that. Um, I think that looking back at that particular project, uh, maybe it could have been done slightly different and maybe written in a different way to hit the right audiences. Uh, this was at a time when data uh, and data visualization wasn't so mainstream and kind of more of a rarity. Uh, the New York Times hadn't had their uh, full data visualization uh, a team yet, their investigative data investigative journalism. So over here, you can see a a big broadsheet of uh, a piece that we were doing on the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, civilian military casualties, an exhibition uh, down the lower left-hand corner designed for the other 90%, which was at the Cooper Hewitt that really talked about design and impact for um, people on the ground uh, dealing with real world issues. And from there, uh, I went over as Austin said to the Netherlands where I started a small design studio called Content Context and was working as a teacher at the Willem de Koning Academy. And that's really where I started to dig into data even more and started to take on more data driven uh, projects and working with data as a, as a content type and for more social issues. And actually I think Sky and I, we had talked about this at one point. This piece here, the Great Plastic Tide, was a project that we were uh, that we had conceived and worked on, um, and a documentary came out afterwards that this was tied to. But I think the data, Sky, was correct. The data you actually had worked on the collection of this data. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which we didn't figure out until years later. I think we were in Beirut and we were talking about it. I was like, oh, hey, I did this piece for um, this uh, magazine called Volume on this. She's like, oh, did you use this data set from, not from Noah, but anyway, the, the data source. And I was like, oh yeah, I think I worked on collecting that data. So it was nice that these bridges were built, uh, built later on. So then from the Netherlands, I uh, moved to, to London where I was the design director at Beyond Word Studio. And then, um, had gone to Data for Change to facilitate some workshops. And that's where I became a uh, more of a facilitation running workshops and, and diving deeper into how we can get people around the table from all types of different backgrounds 
and start to democratize data and design so that everyone could participate in it in a meaningful way to be able to shape projects and begin to put data back into the hands of people um, and to kind of liberate it from this monotonous spreadsheets and, and, and really start to dig into everything can be data. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And then from uh, London, moved to Italy, where I'm currently based and calling in from today. And this is where now I'm really full on at Data for Change and have become also an ac accidental advocate, I like to call. Um, at Data for Change, we're really topic agnostic and we really like to support civil society organizations um, with tools and methods and resources to be able to find their own, their own voices and narratives. And we're there to help them uh, figure out what they want to do and who they want to communicate with and how they want to communicate with them. So before we jump into that, I'd like to just quickly talk to you and something that I'm really, really passionate about and, and really uh, advocating for as a, as a person designer and also uh, at Data for Change is that data is anything and it's everywhere. Now, we just need to look for it and figure out what it is that we want it to be. So we've kind of got this, co this kind of common, common um, saying, if you can collect it, you can measure it and you can learn from it, then you can call it data. But data is just another content type, right? So we can change it and morph it and work with it and, and shape it to um, find the deeper hitting meetings down inside, inside of the data to really humanize it and tell stories with it. And so data is just data until we turn it into information. So going from data to information to knowledge and from wisdom and really taking that wisdom that we take from the knowledge and turn that into uh, What's the into actionable wisdom and knowledge so that we can start to create advocacy campaigns in and around uh, the data that we're presenting to people. But within all of that, um, there wasn't a lot of, so I'd like to talk to you very quickly about a particular project that I had started called Viz in the Wild that helped me to be able to spot patterns. And when I got into data visualization, there wasn't a lot of uh, books or tools around. It was a really a craft of, of, of trial and error. And it wasn't until I started at Data for Change, I was like, I really have to get into this deeper. I don't have a statistics background, I'm very um, forward about that, but I've, you know, I've read books, I've taken some courses here and there. But one thing that always really um, struck me as quite a difficult thing was to, to be able to spot, 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 sorry, spot patterns in data. And so I started looking around the world the, the world around me and starting to try to figure out, okay, well, what can I see to be able to look at, to be able to see, okay, is that data or is that some sort of visualization to be able to tie and connect things together? And our brains are really, really, really good at spawning patterns. So for example, you know, people see things where they want to see things and find meaning in stories where they want to find meanings in stories. Like for example, in Jesus Toast, there's, brilliant amount of posts <laughs> on Google images about Jesus toast um, or looking and spotting patterns about um, anything, imaginary things in clouds. We often daydream and, and, and then look to see what we can find in clouds or faces in places. You know, you put two, two, two dots and some sort of like mouth shaped thing around somewhere and we start to see faces and emotions within that. Um, this particular face may remind you of a famous actor. So I'm going to ask everyone very quickly if they could just type in the chat who they think this might be. Steve Buscemi, close, very, very close. Anyone else? Any other guesses? <laughs> it's got the buggy eyes. Yes, it does. Maybe focus in a little bit around the mouth area in conjunction with the buggy eyes. Anyone? All right. Willem Dafoe, Trump. <laughs> close, close, close. Rocky, we've got Rocky here. I mean, it's almost <laughs> uncanny, the uh, resemblance between this building and this particular shot um, in Rocky. So with that and that logic prime in our heads, 
I started to look at the world around us and try to figure out, okay, you know what? Actually, the same thing can apply for data visualizations. If we crop in and start looking at things and you can find devices and data all over the place. So for example, what might we have here? GitHub comments, exactly. So it's really, it's really, really, really great that someone's already, exactly. So, and this is fantastic that people are already drawing, you know, fictitious analysis and have already named the, the, the chart itself. That's right, a line graph. And it's great that you see this like uh, trend going up or potentially going down, depending on how you're observing it, but you can start to see and start to apply uh, these, these types of uh, experiences to these types of uh, images. Exactly, line chart. With this particular one, what might we have here? Actually, this was the very first Viz in the wild. Yep, exactly, pie chart, bingo. And here? Line graph, ooh, nice. Yeah, it could be dots on a line graph, bar graph, yep, a type of bar graph, a lollipop chart. All right, what do we have here? Venn diagram, exactly. I hope that people treat the Venn diagram with a little bit more respect than the person who created this one. What about here? This one might be a little bit more abstract. Scatter plot, yeah, nice. Pretty close, pretty close, pretty close. Uh, if you were to shade in all of those areas, you'd have an area graph. So this one was from Tortellini uh, that spilt out on the ground and I can imagine the, 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 the area graph itself charting someone's emotions you know, realizing what they did on the upward slope, the sheer horror and sadness at the peak and then the crash of emotion and continuing on their chart because these things are handmade and very delicious. Okay, last but not least, what might we have here? This one's a bit difficult because from a far perspective. But those of you that said scatterplot uh, in the last round, this is what we've got here in this round. So now that our brains are primed and ready, now we can start to talk about data for change. So at Data for Change, we defend human rights uh, with data and we empower people and communities and organizations to collect uh, and communicate data in innovative and accessible ways, but also responsible ways. So here's a quick map just to show you where some of our networks, uh, where our network is operating from, where some of our civil society organizations are. A uh, quick note about that. You may hear me say CSO during the chat. Um, it just a short acronym for civil society organization, which is basically an, a non-governmental organization or an NGO or any kind of organization, even a community-based organization, um, just in case uh, I slip up and say that instead of civil society organization. And so we help civil society organizations collect, or sorry, to, uh, we have three streams of work in which we support civil society organizations. And the first one is to collect data. Oftentimes, the organizations that we're working with um, are unrepresented in official data sets because the, 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 the larger powers that be maybe don't want to include them or because of security reasons. Um, and they just, can't, they just can't be a part of official data sets because maybe they're a persecuted community or a community that's under fire from a, another particular group. And so we either help them collect original data sets to be in control of their own narratives, to understand who they would like to have access to their data or who they would like to communicate the data with. And we do that through a variety of ways. Um, and we'll talk about some of those here when we get into the projects, but you know, from scraping websites to traditional surveys to creating um, little bits of tech or even creating um, wall murals or interactive, dot sticker voting. Um, as I said before, anything that we can essentially uh, use to measure, collect, and do it in a, in a methodological way and reproduce that and, and, and document it, then we will consider that a uh, collection type. The second way is through coaching. And what we do is we help organizations, uh, we lead them through a series of different types of training. So we have a data fellowship, data boot camps, where we really go through more of the practical aspects of, uh, of the data pipeline from collecting data, even conceiving how they may collect data to uh, communicating data and to figuring out um, 
what those particular uh, outputs they may want to create and how to create a advocacy strategy in and around uh, those particular outputs. And the last but not least is uh, communicate. This is where we really like to experiment and we'll get into some of those projects here in a minute uh, in and around how and where communities uh, audiences are, who they're particularly talking to, who they would like to talk to, and how those people like to receive information. So here we have a quick overview. We have a, a poem that was done in South Sudan. We have a book that was done uh, in Amman. Uh, we have, uh, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, it's called Without, not Without Fear. It's called um, Hear the Blind Spot, which is a, a, a data um, audio, a data sonification, which we'll talk about here in a bit. And so one of the ways that we also uh, bring everyone together is before COVID, we were running uh, five-day uh, sprints. And since we, before the pandemic, we had to kind of, oh, during the, sorry, before the pandemic, we were running these five-day sprints. And after the pandemic, we really had to move everything online, but now we're getting back into running sprints now that things have quasi returned back to normal. Uh, and it was an opportunity to bring um, different people and perspectives together around the table to focus in on some of really tough challenges. And in this particular shot, we've got uh, uh, groups coming all, from all over the place. Um, and we've got uh, data journalists, creative technologists, we've got the civil society organization representatives. We've got uh, journalists and we've got designers to come together for five days, look at a very, very difficult uh, topic and try to figure out what they could do. And some of the projects that we'll look at here in a minute will uh, are outputs from that five-day sprint. And for the designers and the creatives, it's really the first time that they can sit face-to-face -face with civil society organizations and hear the problems directly because oftentimes the civil society organizations representatives are often members of the communities that they're representing. And for the civil society organizations, it's a time for them to meet these fantastic creatives to be able to really round out and figure out some sort of data uh, uh, advocacy project prototype. And then uh, we find funding for that uh, prototype later on to realize it into a full-fledged uh, data advocacy campaign. And for the creatives, it's also a time to connect with people uh, from around the world that forge really strong friendships. And we've had a lot of um, continued collaborations amongst creatives and the civil society organizations without the involvement of Data for Change Post, because now everyone is connected within the network and can reach out to each other so that sustained creative partnership last just outside of the, of the workshop environment as well. So here's what a typical team looks like. Uh, we've, we have this uh, term where we say we like to create uh, curate conflict, meaning that we have people from different perspectives to get together and within the confines of, of the sprint environment really kind of challenge each other's ideas, obviously in respectful ways, uh, that drive more durable, robust solutions for potential uh, projects. So for example, here we have our CSOs um, who traveled all the way from Yemen. Uh, actually, this was the 2018 workshop who traveled from Yemen. They actually had the shortest distance to go, um, Amar and Tawfiq from an organization called Yemen Polling Center, they had the shortest distance to go, but actually traveled the longest. And they had to take a bus through two active war zones. Uh, our data wrangler, Santu, is from, is from Mexico City. Web developer, Matthew, who I believe is based in Seattle now. Uh, a data journalist, Colleen. Our team leader, Marwa, who is a um, designer, UX designer from Beirut, and then Huda, our graphic designer from Libya. So this is just a representative of what one of the kind of classic data for change teams would look like. And these are all the spots that we've held are uh, 
workshops since 2014. Um, our last one was just uh, actually in Nairobi last year in 2023. Um, you can see that we've had uh, quite a few in Beirut, one in Kampala, one in Amman, uh, two in Nairobi. Um, during Right before the pandemic, we squeezed one in in Tallinn before uh, we knew anything was happening. And then in 2020 and 2021, we started to run them digitally and still doing that as well. And the whole point really about helping and bringing civil society organizations together with creatives is they've got amazing data sets. And oftentimes they don't realize that they have amazing data sets and they're often locked away in PDFs or behind uh, websites, maybe very buried very deep. So this is really an opportunity to find those hidden stories and to really uh, bring them to life. And again, in the, in, the, in the process of doing so, we also like to say, instead of thinking outside of the box, let's think inside of the box, because more often than not, we have the tools and the solutions that we need right in front of us. We just need to hack the box to be able to figure out what it is that we need to do. Uh, oh, here's, okay. So another quick wall of uh, project before we start jumping into some of the little case studies. Um, so we have some uh, projects here. Uh, I Am Binadam was a project for LGBTQI um, organization in Tanzania uh, about the acceptance. It was a perception change campaign. Um, and it was the story about two particular uh, fictitious characters, but based in reality. So using fiction as a way to advocate for the existence of the LGBTQI plus community in Tanzania, because the, the I am Benedam means I am human, um, because there is a big perception on the ground that people that people from the LGBTQI community don't exist. So this was an awareness campaign uh, telling the lives of stories of two fictitious characters. Um, then we have uh, Harass Map in Egypt over here in the right hand corner, Just mouse over this, um, that documented and collected data on sexual harassment and, and uh, locate and located that and retold uh, the accounts through the map. Then we also have um, in the upper left hand corner, Rearac, which is actually a project that Sky had worked on as well. Um, about internally displaced persons during um, the invasion of Iraq and what and where and how they reoccupied Iraq afterwards. So let's look at some uh, some projects a little bit more in depth. So the first project I actually want to take you through is a campaign that kicked off in the beginning of the pandemic called COVID-19 Campaigns, where we assembled um, a group of uh, designers and teams to create these social media uh, assets um, that the WHO had released some data sets and said, hey, we need some help um, to the public. They'd released the data sets to the public. And they said, hey, we need some help translating these. And also we, need, we would love to be able to localize these, but also design them and, and distribute them in such a way that um, people can access them. Now, there was a lot of posters coming in, a lot of imagery and stuff. And so we put our heads together and we're like, well, how can we, how can we really meet people where they are? during the pandemic, we're like, okay, people probably are mostly going to either be on social media or they're going to be on their phones, um, chatting with people and, and, and you know, having these conversations through, you know, more often than what they were pre-pandemic. So what we did is we created a suite of GIFs and we then created a Google site for, but then what we thought were like, okay, how the heck are we going to meet people where they are um, and how are we going to distribute all this content? Because coming to this website and this repository that we built is pretty clunky and didn't really work. So halfway through, we scrapped this idea. We're like, okay, why don't we just upload everything to as many GIF keyboards as we possibly can? So I think actually the numbers are higher now. I think we reach about like 42.8 million people. Uh, I, I think was the last stat that we had. So it, actually, if you go to any social media um, platform or anything that has a GIF keyboard in it, and you put in hashtag data for change, you'll get all of our COVID-19 campaign. And then we're like, okay, yeah, but you can't have everything. So then we start filtering down. We're like, okay, well, let's start creating a series of hashtags. So then it was like, hashtag data for change, hashtag country, and that will just start serving all of the content and uh, translated content for that specific country um, 
so I think we did Lebanon, we did um, India, we did Egypt, obviously the US because everything was in English or mostly, you know, English speaking countries. And then we did, I think that's, we did, yeah, Egypt, Lebanon, oh no, uh, India and Ethiopia as well, Ethiopia, we had, we had it there as well. The other project that I wanted to share with you, uh, this one's particularly interesting because it basically collects data and visualizes it, starts a conversation all at once. So this is uh, a project that we did with the Social Justice Center um, in uh, Nairobi. And they were really curious about the lived experiences of their organization, or sorry, of their community um, during COVID-19. So, we convened uh, the Social Justice Center and some of their community members um, after the pandemic to basically create this mural. And then the mural um, became the way that the data was captured. So by taking a string and connecting it to the different responses, people could visualize their stories through the strings and instantly visual and instantly visualize and start telling a story. And then you have people to connect with and talk about that shared lived experiences. And they also had um, a series of uh, stencils in which you could uh, respond to another type of survey a little bit further down on the wall to who helped you the most during the um, during the pandemic. And so the beautiful thing about this is that it kind of it, it liberates the data out of spreadsheets it instantly starts a conversation and it instantly starts to build community bonds once people start talking and sharing uh, their lived experiences because they realize also that they're not alone and so um, this came out of one of our uh, fellowship programs so the team that we had assembled uh, to create this uh, um, during the design research had learned that in uh, this particular county in Nairobi that um, that murals uh, were a primary uh, way of delivering information and, and a lot of public service announcements from official uh, sources often come in, uh, in the form of a mural. So during that kind of discovery phase, we're like, okay, well, why don't we just start doing data murals uh, and, and start putting them together and coming from, uh, coming from the organization. And they were like, yeah, why don't we do that? And so we jumped up a couple of different ways and sketched that out and then put this together um, for them. Then they put the, they put everything, they pulled, they pulled and pulled all the resources, did all of the murals um, and then collected the data. There's a video of this on YouTube, which I'll share afterwards um, where you can hear from Steven, uh, the founder of, uh, of, of of the Social Justice Center and why the particular importance of not just putting things into a PDF or just creating this kind of classic report, why this was so much more meaningful uh, to people. Ah, so this is a great project that came from um, Somalia. Uh, it was done with an organization called Digital Shelter. It's called Without Fear. And it was a small online survey of digital shelters, uh, female um, community members who were uh, who felt targeted. They were journalists and activists who felt targeted uh, during a particular period in Somalia. Um, and they wanted to understand better how people or how that that particular community was feeling. Um, and so, with the digital survey results. Uh, again, during the design um, exploration phase with the civil society, with Digital Shelter, the organization, uh, poetry came out that that was the primary um, way of communicating or some, a, a way of expressing meaningful content that people would respond to. And so what we did is with the data analysts created a, a data brief of insights. And then we found the top female Somali poet, Zahara Mohammed, and we gave her that data brief and the raw data. And we said, would you be interested in creating a poem uh, from this data set? And she said, yeah, absolutely. And so we left it over to her and she came back with, the, with this very, very beautiful uh, written poem and actually wound up titling uh, uh, the project without fear, Kapsilan uh, in, in, in Somali. And 
And basically this was the entry point into the data. So taking, to, you know, the, while the data is there and important, it, it, it drove the, the poem, but at the end of the day, it was really about figuring out where people are, how they want to communicate, how they want information communicated to them and uh, uh, delivering that in such a way. So you can still access the data, you can still share data, classic data visualizations, but that is not the, the, the front entrance to the piece. A uh, similar project, uh, Bride Without a Doll. Uh, this was done for the um, um, an organization in Jordan, um, the Arab Women's Organization. Uh, thank you, AWO. I was like, oh, yes, thank only, you. only because I helped with that. I know because Sky also worked on this project. Uh, this was actually born out of uh, out of the uh, uh, workshop in Amman. And basically, it's a story that tackles um, underage marriage within the Syrian refugee community in, in Amman. And basically, it's, it's, it's a book that can be read from the, the perspective of the, the daughter and the perspective of the parents. And basically, the story meets in the middle, and it talks through different data points throughout. Um, so another way, you know, again, the data, the data has driven uh, the construction and conceptualization of the of the book and there was a series of posters that came with it that had more of the data insights and data visualizations with it but again the main the main narrative and the entry point isn't the data itself it's there as a supporting content type to the larger story uh, this was actually a pretty interesting uh, project as well it's uh, from cradle to grave uh, it's just about the story of lebanese life that's paid through bribes now to get things done in Lebanon, especially in Beirut, uh, you have to pay these small bribes, but these small bribes add up and people don't really keep track of them because it's such a small, insignificant amount. So recontextualizing the data, the team came up with a way like, okay, if you were to take all this money that someone is paying continually for bribes, how much would that cost? So while this may not work in every context, in this particular context, it works. So in, on average, in a lifetime, People spend on small uh, uh, corruption bribes, the equivalent of 8,850 um, shawarmas or 11,806 falafel sandwiches, or basically they would be able to buy one and a half cars, or they would be able to purchase 1,662 tanks of gas. So taking something and putting it into a number that is actually meaningful and representative for people, can potentially change the way that people view that thing and start to re maybe recalculate or calibrate how they may interact with, with, with bribes, for example, may, maybe stop paying them or be like, wow, okay, you know, I actually didn't realize how much that was. We need to get, we need to do something about this. Um, so this was a prototype for an idea uh, during one of the uh, sprints. And then, you know, some of the initial tests so uh, that they had created. And we can see that, you know, that while the, while the data itself, you know, as a visualization is, is quite interesting and what, you know, down here in the lower right hand corner, looking at the different uh, types of bribes and how those equate and how they mass, it's much more interesting from a storytelling perspective to reframe those numbers and give someone something to a bit more uh, tangible to, 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 to bite into. Uh, we Are Sudan was another interesting project. Again, another uh, uh, sprint output. Um, what was particularly interesting about this project was in Sudan at the time, it was illegal to congregate outside in masses of more than five people because the government was worried about protests. So people were confined to you know, their indoor quarters, but there was this weird law that the design team had discovered about you could congregate for theater and other types of performances. So what the or so what the sprint team here created was this platform where people could share opinions, but then they would also um, generate data-driven scripts and plays. So 
people could take these out into the street and perform the data and start using people that would amass for this as data points within these different scenarios. Um, so you transmit data in a completely different way. Unfortunately, we never got any um, photographs of the of the of the interaction or sorry, the interventions that um, that the that case the organization um, had performed. But another interesting way, so it's like data out of the spreadsheets and into the streets. So this was a project we had mentioned and looked at the team earlier, uh, Perceiving Yemen. So this is a particularly interesting project from its many, many constraints. At the time, uh, Yemen, well, it still is, a, you know, it was at the heart of its civil war and engaged in quite some hefty conflict. And you have, I think it was at the particular time, like 21% of the population was illiterate and, you know, electricity is intermittent. Um, you know, battery lives are, are, are very precious on phones, but then also um, Yemen polling center was also uh, sending people out into the field to collect the data. So we'll talk about this little gadget piece here in a second. But the design of this piece was meant to be uh, extremely light and only use two basic data visualizations. Um, and because of the uh, illiteracy rate, each data visualization is accompanied by an audio file that explains what's happening in the various forms. The only image that's used in the project is specifically on the landing page and everything else is done in code. So the map of Yemen is rendered in code and the bubbles are rendered in code, which makes it significantly lighter. The reason for the dark background, because those pixels are off, which preserves battery life. Um, and you're able to actually download the website in, uh, I think under like two megabytes. So people can, uh, which, you know, is still quite, actually, sorry, sorry, under, it's one and a half megabytes, which is still a little bit, but not as much, as heavy as it would be. So actually people could update and then actually pass the website around in WhatsApp groups or any other type of telegram signal um, with a dated um, packaged file. So you know when the date when the data was last updated. Um, and so yeah, you can you can download the the site. There was a little option for that as well. Um, so this particular um, piece of tech was quite cool. Uh, it, was basically a, it is a Raspberry Pi that you can connect to um, through its Wi-Fi transmitting capability. And anyone can connect to it via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and actually take the survey from it um, directly on your screen. Um, with the Bluetooth on like older phones, there was like binary inputs like one, two, three, four for different questions. Um, and basically what this did is it took the, it, 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 it took, human lives out of the field and replaced it with something where they could reach more people and collect data on a more frequent basis because they distributed these to trusted um, people in the field and then they were put in locations that people could access them. What was also cool about this was that we could also upload schooling material or other types of material or content to the hub that then teachers could download um, to keep their classes going and at least still have some form of, of, of education um, process continuing during this very, very turbulent time. And then uh, every two weeks or so, um, someone would come and download the data uh, to a USB key and then bring it back to their headquarters. And then we would, um, they, at the uh, Yemen Polling Center headquarters, they still had satellite links. So then they would transmit the data to us um, and with a little JavaScript, it would take those raw uh, CSV files and translate it uh, into Google Sheets and then update the website live. Uh, so this is a, a project that we just finished up. It actually, it's been going on for about three years um, called The Future with Joaquin Beasy. This was done with two organizations in uh, Nairobi and also um, Kampala that wanted to look at their communities and, and their communities specifically were urban refugees. When we talk about displaced persons, we often hear from UNHCR and people that are living in camps. But the truth is, is that the majority of people who are displaced throughout the world are actually living in urban environments. And they often are uncounted, 
because they slip through the bureaucratic cracks of um, UNHCR and also uh, local governments because they're undocumented. So they wanted to uh, understand better uh, how the lives of urban refugees were affected in um, five, five key areas. The three primary ones were identity and documentation, access to uh, an inclusive economy, and access to uh, education. And so they, they did in-field uh, data collection in a classic way in a survey, and then uh, compiled all the results. I think it, because this was actually during the pandemic, it was quite difficult. And during the first data collection, Uganda went into a snap lockdown. So we had to completely shift um, our entire data collection methodology with the organizations on the ground to be completely remote for a period of about three weeks uh, after the, uh, the government had lifted the lockdown and then could resume obviously within COVID-19 um, uh, uh, safety uh, regulations could resume the, the uh, in-person in collection. But what's interesting about this particular project is, is that every dot that's represented is, is representative of a particular person. And um, well, again, I'll share all these uh, slides and all the links to all the projects uh, afterwards. But then you can actually track um, a person throughout the entire uh, project as uh, with just some very, very basic information. It's all completely anonymized, so you can't actually identify the person. But what was really interesting were some of the, the averages um, of how old people were and the percentage of their lives actually spent in their host countries. So in Kenya, for example, um, and we're talking, it, this is quite a small uh, sample uh, population of about 512 people. It was very difficult to get beyond those numbers during the, the pandemic. So on average, like we've got 32 um, years of age uh, in Kenya, but that 34% of their lives had been spent in Kenya. And in Uganda, it was a little bit older, but less percentage of their lives from that particular uh, survey group um, had been spent in Uganda but that their collective lives, uh, sorry, their collective years lived in the host country was about 4,132 years. Well, these are all very abstract. These were uh, the, like the little profile before you got into the deeper issues. And so this campaign um, has now been running for the better part of three years. And we're just about to finish up another data collection with uh, Youth Voices Community and with Yared, which is uh, Young Africans, um, refugees um, for integral development in, in, in Kampala, and we'll update the site with some of their new findings, but we'll probably take a similar approach uh, depending on what they want to do with the, with the next uh, communications and phases. Um, but even, even, even on the ground and, in, and collecting data, it's a very community-based conversation moment, even when you have uh, this classic survey. Uh, th this particular uh, photo now, um, or these photos that are here, are actually um, the new data collection, uh, which was all done uh, with stickers. Um, because pe one, one of the things that, the, that came back from the first feedback round was, was that people got fatigued from just doing these kind of classic surveys and filling them in on paper. Unfortunately, that's what we had to run with during the first one. So we said, okay, well, why don't we rethink the, uh, the way of uh, the way that we, people can indicate or mark answers, make it a bit more collaborative, anonymize the data a little bit more so we can get some broader um, insights from it. And then we can do a second follow-up collection where we, where we interview individuals uh, to, to have that one-on-one -on -one so we can get that, uh, that qualitative um, data. And so this particular one was a booklet of about like six pages um, of about 12 questions. And those questions were answered collaboratively uh, in groups with, uh, with stickers. And we color coded the stickers based on a couple of key variables. All right, so now I wanna take you through a quick case study of a project called Together. This is the one that I had mentioned uh, before, here the blind spot. Uh, this particular project is interesting because it was our first, um, let's say, foray into data sonification. Um, and so that, again, here's our team, another 
big diverse group of individuals from Ethiopia, Tanzania, Egypt, Italy, Germany, the UK. And basically together is an organization that works with visually impaired people who are either blind or have very, uh, has a very, very heavy, heavy visual impairment. So how then do you communicate data? And, and, and this is kind of the big bone that I have to pick with the word data visualization is that we have five senses uh, that we can tap into to express data or design with data to communicate it in other ways. We don't always have to visualize data. Um, so as, as, as the stat here says, one in 20 people in Ethiopia have a visual impairment and they are being disproportionately affected by social, economic, and now digital exclusion. So <clears throat> in, uh, in, in the data dive and during the design um, exploration phase, uh, together designed this survey um, where in, in May of 2019, where they had 276 uh, visually impaired Ethiopians about their like experiences accessing uh, technology and also in and around the history of Ethiopia and, 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 and the education of um, the history of Ethiopia. And basically discovered that like, okay, there, there's not, even within specialized schools that are helping and supporting these, these individuals, there's still a lack of access to content. And so during, um, during the, the uh, workshop, they put together this kind of like, okay, what are, what's our vision statement for if we're gonna create this prototype and this project and what are our desired outcomes? So basically to tell stories of exclusion in Ethiopia and the history of Ethiopia and you know to raise awareness uh, about together a specific mission, um, their existing reach and to protect uh, to potentially reach new donors, but also to bring um, new technologies in and start to rethink about how we communicate data. So how can we make it more accessible, build support to decrease the isolation that these people are um, experiencing in their daily lives and even in the education uh, system, but also you know to really celebrate the work of together and to inspire um, new potential funding for, for uh, together as an organization as they push the boundaries of what data could be or how data can be communicated. But then also liberating that content to, to, to reach its communities and so that people can have access to, to education and knowledge. So um, we always start by doing a lot of active listening and, and this can happen in many, many, many different ways. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the double diamond and some other design processes. We use a very heavily modified, almost kind of now unrecognizable version of the double diamond and even are starting to explore new methodologies um, to bring people together. But, you know, figuring out who we're talking to, what are the, the root causes, you know, yes and, five whys, these kind of classic um, design sprint um, tools to be able to, to get people to start thinking about them. Um, and actually, you can see up here the third, uh, third post-it note in there, the blind spot, was actually the one that wound up titling the project. Um, and so they were like, okay, well, we can't actually visualize the data in a sense. So one of the particular uh, team members, um, Kim from Germany, he's actually a, a sound engineer. And he's like, well, why don't we just start to translate the, um, translate the data into notes and start to create some compositions from that and just some on some basic scales. So they quickly rapidly prototyped uh, that up and then they did a recording um, from Fasika who read the narrative and then combined them together. And so what you have is here, the blind spot. Now I'm not, I'm sh okay, this should play and I'm hoping that you'll be able to hear as well. If not, I'll send a link. Quick question, can can you hear that or is it not playing the sound? We can't, we can't hear it, unfortunately. Oh, you can't hear it? Okay, sorry, so I'll send that link around. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, as 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 the, I'll just, um, so basically as the um, 
website plays, obviously someone would need to lead uh, one of the community members there. There's a voiceover reading the story, and when it hit it, when it hits a data moment, it plays the data in scale, but then also explains what the different pitches mean and and what uh, uh, a lower note versus a higher note means. So people can start to understand a little bit about the data of, of um, certain types of developments um, through some of the SDGs. Um, let's see. So then after that, they actually transcribed all of the website into actually sheet music and took the took the the let's say the proverbial show on the road and started playing it live in schools. So they had uh, together had one of their um, community members there with a flautist who would then play as 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 the story was being read in Braille because the story was also translated to Braille and being uh, narrated. Uh, again, when the data moments happened, um, the flute was then played. Why the flute during the design discovery? They also found out that this was a very popular instrument, a uh, traditional instrument that was used in, in some in communication of uh, audible stories. And then it was also uh, played on the radio. So then, you know, we've now taken data out of a spreadsheet, put it into uh, Braille, also sheet music, and it's being played live in schools and on national radio. So segue into the last little part. I know we're just about to come up on time, but new ways of communicating with data. Like I said, we've got five senses and what we just looked at with together, you know, looking at the conditions on the ground and again, coming back to hacking the box, looking at what's in front of us, what do we actually have to work with and how we can translate those conditions into new ways of communicating and expressing data. And I just wanted to show you some projects, uh, some quick projects that are from other uh, studios uh, that I thought are quite interesting and actually moments in time that would make for great data visualizations. But before we do that, I totally forgot about this quote. Um, and, and, and all of that actually was from this, this quote that I had read from Timothy Morton ages ago, and he's like, basically paraphrasing, basically we have all the data, we have all the charts that we could possibly have, but they're being presented us in such a way that are kind of completely inaccessible and, 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 and void from making some sort of human connection. So how can we start to live the data? And it was like, yeah, it's so simple. Like, it's very, very simple. How can we start to live the data? So within some of the, the, the projects that Data for Change has created, that's, that's always try to what we find is what's the human story behind it? What's the human connection? And how can we tap into a greater uh, narrative that then leads and then presents the data? So just a qu couple of quick examples before we wrap up. Um, this is a project from uh, Dan Rosegarda. It's called Waterlight. And basically what it is, is uh, in, in Amsterdam, uh, in the main uh, square there, they flooded the square literally with uh, this kind of fog or mist. And then this uh, blue light was projected across it. And uh, every, uh, I think like two or three minutes as the uh, light was being risen, a voice would come on and say a specific meter amount. And then basically it comes on later on that the light represents the uh, level of water that uh, would potentially be in a specific year if the Netherlands was to flood because of climate change. Now, at a certain point, you can see that the light is, or the, the projection is over people's heads. So that completely changes the narrative and the, and the, and the relationship to the data. And people can actually start to, build a new connection with it. And they're like, okay, actually, you know what? This would, I would be very wet and probably not be able to breathe right now because of the, the height of the water. So it gets people to think about things in a new way. Um, Ice Watch from Oliver Eliasson. Um, again, taking, I, I think this was a big missed moment to, you know, where you could have a, 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 a mapping of how quickly this ice is melting in C2. So he basically, it's called Ice Watch. He put, 12 pieces of ice from the Arctic in uh, a couple of different locations around the world. Um, 
but the opportunity could have been to 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 map the rate of melt in that location and in a comparison to what is actually happening in Greenland. So people understand, OK, is it faster or slower? And then they have some sort of understanding um, of what's actually happening in the Arctic or you know in the North Pole. But again, the fact that you can touch this thing or that a child can come up and lick to it, they may not understand fully what they're consuming from the child's perspective, from the, but from the adult's perspective, you now have a piece of the physical data in front of you and you're watching it disappear in front of your own eyes. So then how does that connect back to the larger picture to bring something that's so massive in scale to a more human scale? Same thing with uh, carbon emissions. This was a project that was done ages ago um, at the United Nations um, that basically created these bean bags. And on the tags of the bean bags talked about the amount of um, carbon that was uh, being produced per capita per year in different parts of the world. And, and, and also in global totals as we're seeing here. But again, you know, it changes your relationship with the data and how you interact with it. And the fact that you can kind of see in front of you these big black uh, squishy balls that you would normally use for leisure are now something transformed completely different by this tag and delivering information and data in a new way. Um, okay, and last but, not, get this. Uh, last but not least, um, you know, how can we collect and, and, and visualize data instantly in, in new potential ways? You know, this is, I love this piece because of its lightness, um, but also, uh, you know, rethinking how we think about surveys, for example, you know, and it just instantly visualizes things um, as, as people partake in this, you know, participatory um, action. So again, you know, similar to what we saw with uh, the Social Justice Center, Mahari Social Justice Center. Um, and I think with that, we've come to the end. So I hope that we've got some time for some questions. Because I can see that the chat is full. <laughs> <laughs> I've been keeping track. Okay, great. Um, and if you do have any more, any other questions or comments, please add them. Um, but I'll, I've kind of been putting them in order of, of what might make the most sense. But first, okay. I just want to give you a virtual <laughs> round of applause from, from Portland to, to Boston to Milan. Um, thank Everywhere. you so much. This is not very inspirational. Um, so let's see. I think one of the first questions, um, mm -hmm. well, one of the more, more recent questions, actually, from Austin, who, who introduced you. Um, was the, they said the long-term relationships built between data for change and community mm. organizations are inspiring as design as has a history of creation with little upkeep, what kind of practices within data for change, keep those conversations, relationships, and projects going? Love this question. So, um, we, what, when I, when I showed that first map, um, in network before we are in constant contact with our network and our network is not just the creators, but also the civil society organizations. And we often help organizations. Um, some organizations are very happy with, you know, just having the first time engagement and then that's it. But a lot of organizations, um, because they're often grassroots organizations, um, in terms of organizational transformation, often stick around and we'll help them. I mean, for the last, so I joined in 2000, 18, and I think that all of the organizations that I've worked with since 2018, we have some sort of interaction with them, whether it's us connecting them to new network members or helping them write proposals to find new funding or writing them into our funding proposals so that we kind of like, as the ball gets bigger, we all go forward together. Um, so we're, we, we have a Slack channel, but unfortunately we have, I think, Oh man, and now it's got like, there's gotta be like 300 WhatsApp channels because people don't, you know, Slack is a very Western tool and most people are on either WhatsApp or Signal or uh, Telegram. So we actually have very lively micro groups within that and we try to keep everyone um, informed. Whenever we have an opportunity or an organization has an opportunity, we try to champion those, uh, those opportunities for them um, with support from the network first. And if we can't find support within the network, just because due to availability, we'll call to the larger network of places that we've worked with in the past to help find support for organizations. So 
Um, we really see it as a big family. And once you're in, you kind of can't really get rid of us. <laughs> I hope that, <laughs> yeah. Um, we had some questions about, uh, I think they're like, I'm combining a couple of questions and comments yeah. here, but people said there's, you're, these are very creative and pleasing examples to hear about. Um, people are curious about learning how to do this type of data visualization and about kind of opportunities for sprints and for designers, researchers, you know, like how, kind of how is, how does data for change funded? How do people actually get paid to do yeah. all of this okay. amazing work that seems very, <laughs> very like aspirational, but very difficult to, you know, kind of concretize as a, as a budding designer, or even as a mid-career designer. So going back to kind of my, my track, um, like when I got out of design school, did, things like working in the third sector didn't exist. It was like either go into advertising or you go into graphic design. And if you go into graphic design, it was like, okay, do I go work for a publisher and do book covers? Like it was very sectional and very vertical. And since then, I'm very happy that it's become a lot more holistic. And again, like I said before, data is just a content type, right? So as a person that works with a design, it's just another content that you can integrate into your process and figuring out how to communicate it. A lot of the best journalism that's happening right now is not coming from journalists, but it's coming from people that were architects or product designers that have then transitioned into these roles. Um, I would say from, so there's kind of, now I see a lot of, there's a lot of different avenues to be able to work with organizations. Um, I would say find an organization that you really love their mission and vision and see if they've got any openings or if they would be up to collaborate on something. Working in this kind of uh, field uh, in terms of how you can bring design to start tackling some of these projects may require um, a bit of a shift in thinking where it's not necessarily about the design of the thing up front, but trying to figure out the root cause and how to communicate that and what's actually needed. So purpose and utility um, are, 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 are two big key things. And then in terms of working with data for change, we're starting to do more and more in-person sprints and we'll start to do the open calls again. Um, and Sky can tell you all about this process. We often tease ourselves at data for change because there's four core people or four core team members that if any of us were to actually apply to a data for change event that we wouldn't make it because the talent and skill sets are so incredible and amazing um, that it's just like, eventually none of us that are currently here should be here in the future. People should be coming, like come in and take, and take, take it over. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can do that. Um, so I would say, like, if you're interested, you know, send us an email to hello at data for change um, and let us know what, like, you're interested in. Um, and because we're always trying to grow the network and find new opportunities for people um, to collaborate on projects. Um, we now have the data for change studio, uh, which is part of the nonprofit umbrella. But what allow that allows us to do is to be able to take on more service types of contracts which we would need freelancers to work with our network to realize projects so that we can then take any kind of leftovers or profits, if you want to say that, and put it back into Data for Change, the nonprofit, to feed our core activities. But we are a grant-funded organization uh, traditionally. So we go for, don't we, you know, we'll write proposals and go after projects. Often those times, those projects are the sprints, and then we'll find the organizations who would like to participate in it. Um, and so, yeah, it's usually usually project based uh, funding. Can't recommend highly enough. Um, <laughs> a couple more. Uh, some some are curious about um, like elements of increasing or introducing data literacy that are incorporated into the project. Like you, I know you guys spend you spend a lot of time capacity building yeah. while the designers and web developers are working on the sprint and they don't necessarily need the civil society organization member for a moment. Right. They're busy learning all of these other <laughs> things. And so what is what kind of tools or, or software yeah. would you mind, mind sharing? So, so, out of the, so out of the sprints, we actually developed our data fellowship and our data uh, boot camp. And so the fellowship's actually um, a 12 week long program where um, 
people from organizations from all different skill sets, whether they're experts or you know they've never opened a spreadsheet and come and learn how to go through, effectively traverse the entire pipeline from thinking about, okay, what, what am I looking to do and identifying what I want to do with that data? Do I need data that needs questioning or I have data that needs questioning or do I have questions that need data and then I need to go from there all the way to communicating it. Um, we actually, we, we don't talk about uh, data literacy so much as we talk about um, data attributes and we've got these three different kind of attributes that we're still trying to figure out the language more clearly on, but like data curious, data critical, and then data confident. And the data, and, and if we can think about this as like an equalizer, it's like you need all three of these things to be able to work with data. So the data curious is where I spend most of my time um, and playing with it and, and, and trying to understand how I can communicate it, but then also what's behind it. So where did the data come from? Who often is left out is actually more important than who's part of it, you know, and asking these deeper questions, finding, you know, the sources behind the data, and even, you know, digging into the methodology. Um, I would say where I'm not so confident or data confident is, is, is in the deep, deep analysis parts. Like I can run, you know, certain types of basic regressions and understand patterns, but that's why there's no such thing as the data unicorn. Like it, it, it really requires a team to be able to do all of these things. While, while we can all dabble, like I can do some coding and stuff, but it's not my strong suit, but for small things, I can, I can get by. But that's why it's really important to know what you like about data or what you think you like about data. Explore that and then find other people who you can kind of, you know, augment your team with that then support in those other skills but make sure that they're not all of the same opinion. It's good to have people that you clash with. <laughs> right, totally. Um, I had, We had one request for you to stop sharing your screen so we can okay. see your face bigger. Oh. <laughs> Yay. Um, oh, wow. I, a, maybe a couple okay, more. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, oh, tools. There was a question about, or, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in terms of tools, like actually, for, and, and this actually comes back to the sustainability aspect of all the projects that we do are either freemium or free tools. Like for example, we use a lot of Google Sheets to actually do serverless content management. So we'll develop a lot of a lot of the project. Anything that's web based is developed in a Google Sheet so that we can support the organizations without having to um, use any fancy software. Or um, you know, if we want to do something a bit more um, Flashy, we'll use Flourish, um, which is a great uh, tool for putting data in motion and making it interactive. Uh, data Wrapper is also another fantastic tool for doing more static visualizations. Um, we use actually a lot of Google Slides to um, do a lot of layouts because you can manipulate those slides and it's a lot easier for someone who's a non-designer to um, make designs within Google Slides um, or Google Docs. Um, we even do a lot of prototyping in Google Sheets <laughs> in terms of like wireframing and figuring out content flows of things. Um, RAW is another fantastic program. Uh, we use RAW graphs that was developed by a studio here in Milan called uh, Calibro. Uh, and basically what's great about that from a security standpoint is, is that the data sits all on the client side. So as soon as you leave that browser, that data is not stored. Whereas something like Data Wrapper, depending on what type of account you have, depending on the sensitivity of the data. Oh, we, we sometimes uh, steer people away from Flourish and Data Wrapper because the data cannot be, um, it, it, yeah, it, it could be accessed publicly. I I wanted to repeat something that somebody mentioned here, Golden mentioned, she's, they said it's, um, it's so refreshing to see this work being done in collaboration with African organizations that are so often subjects of study and not recognized as data empowered people. And one thing that I wrote down that I, I wanted to mention is I, I noticed throughout my time with, you know, the brief sprints with data for change and, and your ongoing work is that the word empower is, is never used. It's all about um, tools and, um, you know, providing strategies and capacity building, assuming people are already empowered and they just need a bit more yeah. literacy to, to move forward. Um, I'm wondering how, yeah, kind of, I assume that's been a big learning journey, journey to understand what that balance is and, and, you know, kind of why that's 
so important. And I, yeah, I'm curious what you've learned from doing that for so long, you know, kind of what, what that looks like, or is it different in different places? Yeah, it's, uh, it's exactly this. It's, it depends on the, the, the context and the content of, 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 of the organization and where they're, where they're working and also uh, who they're communicating to, right? Um, you'll have organizations that have uh, such incredible data sets and they won't call it data for some, like, they're just like, we don't have any data. It's like, actually, no, you have amazing data, like even qual you know, uh, uh, um, qualitative data in these interviews. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not big data people. We're, you know, if you have, and I know this challenges a lot of things. If you, if, if you have a collection of five things and if those five things are very rich, and those stories are very rich, you could create some, obviously you're transparent about that this is a data set of five people or you know experiences, but depending on the, 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 the depth of those five things, you could have something very, very rich and very, very robust. Um, and so it, it, it really depends on what the organization is after. Um, I think that like with our data fellowship, the whole thing is to kind of break down that initial barrier that data is for a particular place and for a particular people, but that it's for everyone and we all produce it and we can all figure out how to shape it and communicate it. And when organizations are collecting um, original data, they're then you know in control of who gets to who gets to either see it, who gets to interact with it, and then you know that gives them the incentive to to say and change the narrative uh, for what the, for the change that they want to see on the ground. I mean, regarding that data literacy, the most recent question was how you know, kind of speaking more to, and it gets back to your vis in the wild Instagram mm -hmm. <laughs> of, you know, kind of how how do we, like, why why how why is it so important to increase data literacy? I mean, that's a big loaded question, but. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, a big part of what you're doing is this, you know, especially in the Middle East, North Africa area, decentralized kind of yeah. amplifying work on the ground and meeting people where you at, where they're at, as you said. I'm I'm wondering if you can just speak a little more to the data literacy aspect. Yeah, so it, everyone has a lot of like big digital skills and every, actually people are more data literate than, than people think that they are. Like, uh, it's just a matter of, and, and for us, it's not using, it's not about that term, but it's about breaking the language down. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in design. I'm just going to loop back around to this real quick because it's the same thing in design. For so long, we talked over people's heads to try to validate what we're doing and to earn a place at the table. And it's the same thing with data, like just using some plain language to talk about what data is. And unless you are in a scientific environment there's no need to use that language um there's a great chart that i'll send over that actually talks about um it's actually from the urban institute um this guy john schwabish put it together and it's 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 this inverted pyramid structure and it's great because it's like um who are you talking to and what type of language and how much do you actually need to uh communicate with them and you know once you sit down and start working with people and organizations um it's not a matter again it's not a matter of like literacy per se but it's like these kind like i'll come back to these and again we, we're still rounding up this language but like how data curious are you how data confident and how data critical are you of these things because everyone contains these three attributes and it's a matter of figuring out how much is turned on when but then giving people the skills and the ability to be able to manipulate those three things as they see fit and when they need it. So for example, like if you're very like into analytics and analyzing data, you know, maybe that critical knob and that um and the and the and the confidence knob are higher, but maybe you're not so curious, but in a different way to, you know, because you're scared of what that may mean for those other things. I love those three words. I feel like we can, like, I want to see that visualized. So. Yeah, well, we're working on it. So okay. it's going to come out soon. And actually, I'm, I'm just like with a safe audience trying to, trying to, I would love some feedback on those, on those three words. And like, feel free to reach out afterwards if you've got any thoughts and ideas mm -hmm. about what data curious 
critical or confident can mean. Okay, we'll crowdsource it here and report back. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, we had another question recently. Um, Andrew's asking, have, have you had projects using network analysis? I feel like a lot of hidden power is in the networks of people and their relationships. And only that way can you really see what things are happening. Ah, yes. Um, this is something that we would love to do more of. We're so busy, like even within our own network. Um, I'm trying to think of a particular project. Uh, Harass Map would be a great uh, project uh, that I can link you out to. Let me just pull that up real quick. Um, which was all about um, sexual harassment and the various stories that happened in C2 um, and the experiences. And also one of the things that was quite interesting about this that they had developed was um, when you read the report, you can actually send a letter or like um, an action of support to the person that had experienced this, that, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it's anonymous. Um, um, oh, sorry, I just got sidetracked by another comment. Um, okay. But in terms of actual network, network analysis, I'm trying to think of other projects where we've done that. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head. So if I do, I'll loop back around and send it to you to be shared. Well, maybe I can, if, if nothing else comes in, I have one last question that I feel like is just, yeah, yeah. it speaks to the heart of, of my experience with Data for Change and, and a lot of what you guys um, imbue in all of your projects is, is like Data for Change intentionally invites designers, data scientists, journalists, you know, web developers from all over the world to graphic designers to apply and participate in the sprints. And I'm wondering, you know, it's this big open, like international call. And like, I remember my team, like, I don't even think anybody was from the same continent, <laughs> uh, maybe a couple of people from Egypt, but how, like, why is that so important to, that you intentionally create these teams that are so diverse? I mean, to me, it's, it's made a, a world of just a different way of thinking about the world and continued interactions and relationships with people. And I, I'm curious. How, it's, yeah. it's exactly this because everyone's lived perspective and experiences is, is different to a degree, but also the same to a degree. It just depends on the the con the context in which the person has gone through something, right? And to be able to have people sitting around with diverse ideas and perspectives to be able to challenge the way that, and I say I, I mean the royal I, we, you know, challenge we how how we view and and interact with the world to think about it in a different way. Can you imagine if some of our social media platforms were designed in that way, rather than just five white dudes in Silicon Valley in a closet, like how maybe different things would look now? Um, so it's, 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 that is really the core and the heart of everything. How can we create an environment that's open and inclusive for people to be able to sit down, look at something together, feel comfortable enough to be able to challenge each other's ideas to create, because that's how you create something robust and something that's, you know, that 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 is considerate, considered and considerate and inclusive. Um, one of the key things to mention is, is that with all of our projects, if if and when an idea is generated, it's always community tested. So it always goes back to the community for, for the lack of a better word, uh, feedback and approval, let's say, um, so that they also are part of the journey. Now, we don't always have access, uh, you know, us as data, for, but that's why we work with the organizations and with regional designers and local designers as well, so that they can also be there to understand and to hear that feedback um, and to understand it better. Um, and we never, ever, ever, ever do anything unless the community is behind it. So any, everything that we've ever created, uh, and when, again, when I say we, I don't mean me personally, but the design teams that you know Data for Change puts together um, has, has, has always the seal of approval because that ultimately it's their data and they should decide 
who gets to have access to it and who gets to uh, interact with it. So great. Um, well, thanks so much. I I see some thank yous coming in. I know we're wrapping up with the, the end of the hour and a half. And I just thank you for sharing. It flew by. <laughs> it was awesome. I wish we could talk for another four just, hours. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. Sorry if I made anyone nauseous with my slides. <laughs> Um, we're really excited. Um, we're really excited to bring you in and, and, um, thanks for coming in from your evening, uh, out in Milan. No worries. Uh, um, um you said here's that my you know email address. If anyone wants to talk, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'll put the hello one at there as well. Um, and sorry, I forgot to mention like in our core team, um, our two founders, uh, Bronwyn and Stina, um, you know, we're, we're a female uh, LGBTQI led organization. Um, and then we have another designer. So I'm based in Milan, they're based in Sweden now. And then um, our other um, design, uh, head of design, actually, I've just transitioned to head of creative and, and, and uh, we brought another head of design, Sarasti, um, who's based in the UK, but from India. Sarasti's amazing. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, yes. thank you. No, thank you so much for sharing this moment with me and for letting me rant for an hour and a half. <laughs> no, it was our pleasure. Thank you so much.